Depo 136. Here, the head of the Wagner Group, Prigozhin, publicly announced that they are no longer capable of sustaining such high losses and that they are going to withdraw from Bakhmut on the 10th of May. He accused the Russian Ministry of Defense and other bureaucrats of creating artificial shell shortages due to the envy towards the overshadowing success of his private military company, which makes them look bad and incompetent. This is a clear confirmation that Russian forces will not be able to symbolically establish full control over Bakhmut by the holiday on the 9th of May, which the Ukrainian High Command, commanders of brigades, battalions and just soldiers have been confidently claiming for weeks. In fact, when it comes to the movements of the front line over the last seven days, despite absolutely brutal fights, Russian forces failed to breach Ukrainian defense. As Russians reached the so-called citadel, which is the biggest residential area consisting of 10-story buildings, Russian forces would either incur massive losses by trying to storm it directly from the east, or they would incur massive losses by getting into a crossfire in trying to move around. On top of that, Ukrainians continue conducting devastating tank raids, preventing Russians from consolidating control over the proximate positions. Today, Ukrainian fighters published a video of how two tanks approached Russian positions from two sides and within minutes completely obliterated several buildings at once. With automatic loaders, two tanks can deliver 125mm high-explosive shells every 3 to 5 seconds. Those who survive such a raid are usually finished by snipers who can control the whole perimeter by establishing positions in the citadel. Recently, Russians tried to advance along the western edge, but here Ukrainians also have powerful positions, and as fighters from the 93rd Mechanist Brigade show, the overwhelming fire on Wagner's flanks can quickly hold their assault and prevent rapid and deep penetrations. Once the enemy is immobilized, artillery and mortar crews help to eliminate the stationary attackers. However, the fighting is not easy. Ukrainian fighters continue to say that the biggest problem continues to be Russian artillery. After a week of futile ground assaults, Russians decided to burn everything to the ground. The footage released just several hours ago shows that the whole residential area is under the attack of incendiary munitions. On the other hand, we have already seen a lot of similar attacks on Vuhladar. Even though some buildings catch on fire if an incendiary granule gets inside a flat, the main target of these strikes is likely Ukrainian equipment. And driving between different parts of the western part of the town, very often the vehicles are parked just next to the house under a camouflage netting. This strike once again raised suspiciousness about the genuineness of Prigozhin's claims. As Ukrainian fighters are constantly experiencing heavy shelling, many downplay Prigozhin's claims and speculate that he is pursuing other interests. Some speculate that he's just trying to attract more attention to his company and gain more records and therefore money. Others say that he has political ambitions and wants to replace the Minister of Defense, if not the current president. And some also say that he just failed to fulfill his promises to take Bakhmut by the 9th of May and is trying to deflect the blame and save his reputation. However, many things can be true simultaneously. First of all, after today's other video, where he showed 100 fresh corpses of his soldiers and specifically named Shoigu, Gerasimov and the rest of the Ministry of Defense, calling them all the bad words known to men, it is highly unlikely just attention-seeking and marketing. No one has ever said so many bad things about those at the top and seen a happy retirement, let alone during the war. Secondly, even though Ukrainians indeed experience heavy shelling, they are still successful in preventing Russians from advancing, exactly what Prigozhin complains about. Prigozhin wanted several times more shells not to allow Ukrainians keep their head up, so that he could make some advancements in the citadel. Thirdly, Prigozhin has been raising the alarm about the fact that Ukrainians might be preparing to conduct a massive flank attack and that he is not satisfied with the quality of the defense. Today he also said that Russian bureaucrats are once again exaggerating the number of troops on the flanks in order to submit good reports, while in his experience the flanks are barely holding. He also emphasized multiple times that in the event of a breakthrough, Wagner forces in Bakhmut would be surrounded and eliminated. And coincidentally, yesterday we discussed precisely how Ukrainians are increasing the intensity of fights in the Sivir's direction, relocating their tanks and possibly preparing for a large-scale offensive operation. This also fits very well into the Ukrainian narrative that is increasingly circulating information about an unspecified surprise for Russians and in particular Wagner forces in this direction. Prigozhin has his own intelligence. He probably anticipates it as well and decided to give up Bakhmut and escape the encirclement. It looks like he planned to kill two birds with one stone, take Bakhmut and then escape. 
But the internal politics undermined his efforts by creating artificial shell shortages, which resulted in unsustainable losses and left him with two choices. He can either continue pushing with the last man and see whether they die before or after Ukrainians take Bakhmut into a pocket, or he can save the last man, get out of there before it is too late, and as a bonus save his reputation. When it comes to such monumental news with far-reaching implications, it is extremely important to make sure that the information is not warped. In this case, I just watched the video with angry Prigozhin and with his speech regarding withdrawal, but if there were no video, the first thing I would do is to make sure that it was covered by at least a dozen of reputable sources. The second thing I do is to evaluate the bias of this story, because right-leaning outlets tend to amplify bad news and negative aspects of dealing with Ukraine, while left-leaning outlets tend to do the opposite. In the case of the news about Prigozhin, we can see that there is no pronounced political bias. But the most important indicator that I check is the share of independent news. As you can see, a lot of news sources are owned by wealthy individuals, media conglomerates and governments. A lack of independent news is a very strong signal that someone is trying to push a particular narrative, very often beneficial for these big owners and detrimental for you. In this case, we can see that 12% of 14 articles are from independent sources, which I can easily find in the list of articles on the left-hand side. In order to easily make all these checks, I always read news on the Ground News website. Ground News compiles over 60,000 sources in one place, showing you who owns these sources, how many of them are respectable, and even their political bias. If you read only your favorite sources or let the algorithms decide what news pops up on your feed, then you definitely miss events that one site refuses to cover. Go to ground.news RFU to stay fully informed, compare coverage and avoid media bias. You can use it for free or subscribe before the end of May to get 30% off their unlimited subscription access.